So, uh, I'm changing my uh, Facebook username to nobody. That way, when somebody posts something stupid, it will say, nobody likes this. I've, I've started telling people the benefits of eating dry grapes. It's all about raising awareness. Yeah. Did you guys hear about the guy who got hit in the head with a can of soda? He didn't get hurt because it was a soft drink. I thought I'd take the booger out of my nose, but it's not. Mm. Well, now that we've uh, covered our personal lives, it's dad joke time. We're going to need somebody to get up here and tell a dad joke. How can she tell a dad joke? She's not even a dad. Maybe she identifies as a dad. What's your name and what church are you from? to you, yeah, Mr. Dad Best. What's Forrest Gump's password? One Forrest One. It's good. It's good. If Forrest Gump ran a property management group, what would it be called? New Tenant Dan. Mm. What's the race news for sports for my mom to? All right. Did you enjoy that? All right. Have you uh, have you guys enjoyed your day? Absolutely, it's been a great day. You enjoy the games outside? Oh yeah. All right. So uh, now we're gonna we're gonna pray, and uh, we're gonna change the direction of our uh, our time. We're gonna now focus on what the Lord's been speaking to us. And so, like we did last night, I'm going to ask for those who would. If we would just gather at the altar, asking for God's presence, His blessing, um, and for um, Steelville, this will be the last time that they'll be with us, so we want to pray for them. And then uh, tomorrow morning in our normal service, we'll finish it with our own church. So all those who would like to come and pray, can we come at the altar? Uh, 
Sam, he's a youth pastor for Stillville Baptist, to lead us to start out. Uh, Sam, would you make your way up here? I'll, that way you can have the mic. All right. And then anybody who wants to pray in between, they can, and then I'll end with prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for an amazing weekend. Thank you for giving us the ability to meet in a place like this and safely meet in a place like this. Lord God, I pray for each student here, each child here, each parent, each leader here, that we will open up what we've been um, holding closed, God, that we will that we will open up to your word and to your spirit. Lord God, I pray that you pour out your spirit on each one of us here. I pray that if there's somebody that's hiding something, that if there's somebody that is uh, keeping something from you, that they will open up and give it all to you, that they will truly follow you the way that you call us to follow you. Lord God, I pray that if there's something that's keeping us held back, that we will let go of it, that you will find it, and you will you will give us the courage to let go of it here in front of our friends, in front of our family. Lord God, I pray for each student here that they will give their life to you, that they will devote themselves to you because it is a life worth living, Lord God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege you've given us to gather your name. Thank you for every student that's here today and those that are last night. And Lord, we ask that uh, now as we turn our face toward you, Lord, as we come to the last worship service of the day, Lord, we just uh, we ask that you would just draw our attention off of ourselves, off of our situations, off of home, off of school, whatever might be the distraction, Lord, and may we just focus on what you're saying to us, Lord. We pray that you'd be with the worship team, Lord, that they would be able to sing for your glory. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with Brother Jared as he uh, has prepared and planned and purposed. And Lord, we ask for your anointing. We ask for remembrance. We ask that you'd give him the ability to clearly speak the word of God with truth and grace and power and conviction, Lord. And Father, we pray that our hearts and our minds would be prepared to receive your word that it would encourage us, that it would rebuke us, that it would change us. And Lord, we pray that. We pray for the one who doesn't know you in the free part of sin, who doesn't have eternal life. We pray today for conviction of the Holy Spirit to draw men and women, boys and girls to you. And Lord, we pray for those that have gone astray, those that are outside. The, we ask that you draw them back. And Lord, draw us closer to you. We love you. We trust you. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Greet one another as we get ready. All right, guys, we are ready to um, just focus our attention on the goodness of God this afternoon. So um, I actually have this uh, in my office on my wall. It's this unknown quote, and it says, uh, a disciple is someone who has moved from being the recipient of the church's mission to being responsible for the church's mission. And so as leaders, as pastors, as teachers, that's our goal, okay? Because making disciples is moving us out of being recipients into being on mission for God, okay? And so um, that's that's all we're about. And when we when we see things like 
uh, you showing up for visitation. Okay, that's something that just excites us more than anything else is when we're, be, we're being less of a spectator and more of an active believer, you know, using our gifts to serve the Lord. And so that can look different. Um, it doesn't have to be witnessing. It could be a hundred different things. But, um, you know, that's one thing that I would like to see God do through this conference is for us to understand that. Um, let's stand up together. You know, just going to read this again. Just read that quote with me. A disciple is someone who has moved from being the recipient of the church's mission to being responsible for the church's mission. So let's read this uh, great commission together. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Okay, that's immediate. Uh, faith is immediate, okay, when we respond to God's goodness. Um, let's read the next one. Um, this is another quote. Let me read this. It says, when Jesus stood with these disciples on the mountain in Matthew 28, he didn't have to cajole these guys to go and make disciples. He had to tell them to stop and wait for the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to believe this gospel and to know Christ and be silent. Okay, David Platt says, a privatized faith and a resurrected Christ is practically impossible. Okay, so we want to think about uh, what does it mean to have that resurrection in our hearts? What is God calling us to do, okay? So let's read this together. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Okay? So let's, uh, let's sing this together. This is one of our theme songs this weekend. So uh, where you go, I'll go. I will follow you.
our bass player up here. Pretty cool, huh? All right, kind of a similar thought to last night as we think about not letting Satan discourage us because we are not perfect. I, mean, I heard a guy say once, but we're not becoming like your Uncle Phil, we're becoming like Jesus. And there's a big, big difference. Doesn't matter how good Uncle Phil is, right? Uh, Jesus is perfection. So, um, Let's see, R.C. Sproul Jr., he says, why do bad things happen to good people? That only happened once, and he volunteered, okay? Jesus uh, stepped out uh, before we were born, before, you know, we were even a thought, and uh, he loved us so much that he prepared a way for us to have this relationship with God. Um, So let's read this together. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Jesus is our foundation, and uh, let's sing this one together. We learned this in student life. And I think you guys uh, really resonate with this one. So let's do this together. Everything around me is sinking. 
Seated. Even when, guys, we dig ourselves in a hole, okay, he won't fail. He won't. He won't let us down. All right. Uh, Pastor Chris showed this video uh, a couple weeks ago. I know you guys have seen this, but it just applies so much to kind of how we stumble along through life. So this is a video of a goat falling in a ditch. Okay, let's watch this together. What was the movie? That, oh, it was Thor with the goats. Remember, I was trying to remember what I was doing. Okay, cool. All right. Well, guys, how many of you can relate to that goat? Can you relate to that? All right. God is a rock of ages. He sits on a throne of grace that we talked about last night. 
And so uh, let's do this one together as uh, before Pastor Jared comes. Here we go.
Well, thank you guys for letting me play with you. I really enjoyed that. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 10 again. It'll be in the same passage. Uh, just for a review, I know there's some new people, uh, some people who weren't here last night, and then some uh, that joined us today. And so for review, we said last night that what we're going to be doing is preaching the Word. And so that means we're going to be talking about this book, which has not changed. We said there'd be three things that we could do. Uh, that we're called to do, we're tasked to do as we're preaching the Word. So do you remember what these are? You're like, oh man, we're doing them again. The first one was correct. And we said whoever loves discipline, loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is what? Is stupid. So we're going to have some correction again this afternoon, okay? So we're going to have correction, and what do you say to that? I don't want to be stupid either, all right? I don't want to look stupid, I don't want to be stupid. Okay, then the second thing we said we would do is rebuke. So you rebuke sin, that is to set to a higher standard, so there is kind of the normal way of living, and then for us as believers, we say, no, there's a higher standard of living. And so with that, remember what we were going to say, he who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses it finds mercy. So whenever we rebuke, what do we say? Have mercy. All right. Well, tomorrow, whenever I'm going to get to preach here tomorrow, so uh, students, you get to help me with that tomorrow, okay? So really want to sell that one. And then the last one is to encourage. We talked yesterday how encouragement is to inject. Courage, And so whenever we have encouragement, we would say, I needed to hear that. Amen. I need to hear that. That's right. Amen. That's I agree with it. So uh, here's what I want to ask you today as we're going in. Uh, and the second sermon is to ask you, why the cross? Uh, I mean, honestly, it's a good question. And think about it this way. Think about uh, symbols. In our world, we have a lot of symbols. And so uh, I'm a huge can. Kansas City Chiefs fan, and so if you see the arrow, uh, everybody knows that's the symbol for the greatest football team on planet Earth. Amen? I, I don't know if you guys are like Chicago Bears fans. I don't know what, I don't know if you like the NFL or not, but maybe St. Louis Cardinals would have been better. If you see the red bird, you'd say it's the cards, right? But we have symbols for a bunch of different things, so why is it that we chose the cross? Now, thinking back historically, does anybody know what the fish is called, the Christian fish symbol? You may know the name of that. Well, here's a $5 word for you. Titus was making the symbol there. It's called an ichthus. That's a very old Christian symbol, but that one didn't seem to last. You don't see that all over churches. In fact, whenever I used to travel in ministry, I would always find it interesting to count the crosses. So if your preacher ever got boring, that's what I would do as a kid, is I would count the crosses and I would try to do the math. If we had, uh, we had three on each end of the pew, and so how many pews we had, I was doing the math. So that's what I was doing when I wasn't paying attention, was counting crosses. So why is it that the cross is what lasted throughout culture uh, compared to the fish? Or some of the other symbols that we've had, the Alpha and Omega symbols, another one, the clover, which represented the Trinity. Some people use that. Uh, I thought, man, a good one would be like bread, because Jesus said he was the bread of life, and so maybe that would have been a good symbol. But why is it that the cross is the central theme of Christianity. It's the one symbol that we kind of return back to. So we're here in Matthew chapter 10, and what's interesting about this, this is the first time in the New Testament that the cross is going to be mentioned. Very first time. So think about this as the disciples of Jesus. Jesus, he says, cross here, unless you, follow, unless you take up your cross and follow me. 
you're not un, you're you're unworthy to to be my disciple, right? And so the thought here is that would be a pretty shocking thing for the first time to have this concept introduced. So we're in Matthew chapter ten, verse thirty four. Would you stand in honor of reading God's word? <clears throat> Matthew chapter ten, verse thirty four. It says this: Do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth. I have not come to bring peace, peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask that this afternoon that you would allow me to preach your word and that you'd allow me to preach it accurately. Father, I pray for each person here. You know every distraction. You know every person that um, needs to hear the message today. And so, Father, I pray that you'd speak in a way that I can't. Would you speak to these students' hearts? Would you speak to their minds? Would you, would you do business with them? And, Father, I ask that you would do it with me as well. Father, I pray that you would draw us each to you. Father, we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, last night we talked about, we gave those three things. We gave an encouragement, we gave it a correction, we gave a rebuke. So last night the correction was that Jesus brings out, uh, doesn't bring outward peace. Uh, he'll do that the second time he comes. So uh, this time he brings inward peace in your heart, but often outward persecution. Then we had a rebuke, which was uh, that there should be no rivals. No one should compare with the love and devotion we have for Jesus Christ. And the last one, the encouraging one, was whoever. As you heard that tonight, uh, or this afternoon, you'd see there was five times that whoever was repeated. So I'm going to start this morning, or this evening, with an encouragement. And here's what the encouragement is. And the point that I want to make today is, why is the cross important? So the first thing I would say is that, what, this is my encouragement for you, is that you are God's special creation, that he made you, in scripture it says that he knit you together in his mother's womb. Now I wasn't planning on this, but I thought this was really cool that I was asked to play today. And so the reason why is because I built this bass guitar. And so there's not another one like it in the whole world. I built it because uh, my grandpa, um, we started playing music, and so my grandpa was going to build it with me. He was a woodworker. So I do not know how to play anything on the guitar. There was some miscommunication there. So the special earlier was, was pretty special for me because that's the most I have ever played a guitar on stage that was not a bass guitar. So the bass, is it on? I could do that a little bit better. Yeah, do you know what slap is? I'll do a slap thing for you because I like that. So... I think that sounds cooler, but that's bass. So, um, no, no, hold your applause, please. Ba bass never gets solos. They're like, and now to the bass guitar. So for 10 years, I played and did nothing more than this. Kind of like the, the Baptist two-step. So anyways, I built the bass guitar up there. So it's very special to me. Now, here's the thing about it. I bought, I went out and bought the wood. I bought this type of wood, which is walnut and maple, because those were my grandpa's favorite woods. And so my grandpa had gotten sick, and he said, hey, let's build that together. So I purchased it. And now, think, whenever I purchased it, I could have done whatever I wanted with that wood. My grandpa was very good with wood. We could have tried to make like a coffee table or some, something kind of decorative, or maybe put it on the lathe and build a, a bowl. But what we decided to do is to make an instrument now, unfortunately, uh, my grandpa passed away before we could finish. So what I did was I made it really, uh, the Nelson, it says on top of it, it says Nelson, uh, which was my grandpa's name. So I did it kind of in honor of him. So that guitar is very valuable to me because I made it, and I made it kind of in honor of my grandpa. Now, whenever I say that you are uh, a special person, here's why. It's because you were made 
in the image of God. It says in Genesis, uh, God says, you know, there the whole Trinity is kind of together. And he says, let us make man in our image. So the reason that you're special is not because, you know, you're great at soccer or, or great at some other thing. The reason you're special is because you have a very special task. You were made on purpose. You were made with a purpose, and the purpose is to be an image bearer. You're, you're supposed to represent God to the world. That's a pretty tall task, isn't it? And not only that, but you are hand-formed, right? You go to Genesis, and it says that, that he formed them out of the dust, and then he breathed life into them. And now we compare for us that to Psalms 139 that says, he knit you together in your mother's womb. Now, I know you might not believe that, uh, but you are specially made. The problem is that we don't do a very good job of reflecting God's image. And you look around the world, and we, we read about people and what's happening, and we think this is... They're not being very good image bearers. And so the problem here is that we're not bearing the image very well. In fact, in Genesis, they rebel, and so they sin, and now we've got this sinful nature. In fact, you kind of follow the storyline, and what happens is Adam and Eve, they rebel, and so God gives them a punishment, right? There's a curse. That is, they're going to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Now, their son, Cain, kills his brother Abel. But what's really interesting about their story is that Cain is told whenever he's He's tempted in anger. He says, sin is crouching at your door. So, Titus, you want to help me out again with the lion figure? You did a great job with that, buddy. Here's what God tells Cain. He says, sin is crouching at your door. Now, it's kind of some symbolism there, because what's happening is that the, the people are going to choose to act like animals instead of acting like image bearers. In fact, you can kind of fast forward and see this several different times in Scripture that people are just acting on their base instincts. And so often they would be angry and they would kill somebody or they would be filled with lust and they, may, they might rape someone. And so what you're seeing is that these people who were supposed to be image bearers are not very good at being image bearers. Instead, they act like animals. So you fast forward all the way to the book of Romans and it says that these people who deny the existence of God that he gave them over to a depraved mind. What's that mean? It means that they were just going to act like animals. You could go to any junior high. It, could I get an amen, girls? You could go to any junior high and say, yeah, those boys, they just act like animals, right? And, and you see it, and not just junior high boys, uh, but could I just call a timeout and say, junior high boys, one difference between an animal and a person is bathing. Like, you should shower, you should wear deodorant. That's just a great, great blessing of the Lord, amen? So, uh, what we've been called to do is be image bearers, but the problem is we're not very good image bearers. So, that's what our problem is. So, as encouraging as it is that you're created to be in the image of God, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory, so we're not doing a very good job reflecting that. So, what does God do there in Genesis 3? He pronounces a curse on them. Anybody want to give me kind of what all happens in the curse in Genesis 3? The there's a couple things that are going to happen as a result of the curse. Thorns and weeds. All right, that was good. Anyone else? Remember what happens in the curse? Thorns and weeds. You're going to work by the sweat of your brow. I have a, a blister on my hand from working the other day, and a, a friend of mine, the guy I was working with, he said, yeah, you're a lot like a blister. You show up after the work's done. And so, I don't know, that's my dad joke for the day. You know, well, whatever. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, you're going you're gonna, to uh, accomplish work by the sweat of your brow. But the major thing is that there's now going to be a separation. Part of this curse is they're going to be kicked out of the garden. They're not going to be dwelling with the Lord. Now, if we fast forward and say, so why is the cross important? Jesus here says, unless you pick up your cross and follow me, you're unworthy of me. So why is it that he's picking up the cross? It's because ultimately it's going to be on the cross that Jesus is going to make the redemption of that image. We're going to now have the ability to properly reflect the King of Kings. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians. I think this is a great passage to kind of um, not go over everything that happens on the cross, but surely to go over a, a good portion of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we're going to read through 21. This is one of my favorite passages. It says this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and, uh, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, we're going to work through this passage backwards, because I think backwards is the best way to kind of understand what Jesus did on the cross. Number one, Jesus became sin for us. He actually took on that curse. So the curse that God made, the the curse about the thorns, you you remember what they placed on Jesus' head? It was thorns. And and you remember how the, the curse was that we would be separated from God? And what is it that Jesus says on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In every way, Jesus becomes our sin. He, he comes onto the cross, and he is going to take the curse on himself. In, in Galatians, it says, Cursed is anyone who was hung on the tree. And Jesus became the curse for us. So thinking about this curse, there's a, a, kind of a multitude here, but one is with the cross, there was a great deal of physical pain. Now, I told you that I made this guitar uh, kind of in honor of my grandpa because my grandpa was my hero. Now, uh, last night I gave the description of Chris... Uh, Evans, is that guy, the guy's name? So in all honesty, I know this is going to sound weird, that's what my grandpa looked like. My grandpa was six foot tall, 210 pounds, had a 29-inch waist, and a 48-inch chest. So he looked like a bodybuilder. I mean, he was just huge. There was nothing that I ever saw anyone do that my grandpa couldn't do. One time, some of the uncles, they were kind of messing around, and they were trying to pick up a, a big um, piece of iron. What do they call it? Like the forge? Yes. An anvil. They're trying to pick up this large anvil. And so each one would kind of like try to deadlift it. And my grandpa, probably in his 50s, walked over and said like this and picked it up and put it over his head five times and set it down. Everyone just walked away. I I, I just love my grandpa. There was a time that, you know, my son's got a special need. And there was a guy, this was before I was born, but there were some guys that were picking on a young man with special need. And my grandpa said, hey, you leave him alone. And there's another grown man. And he said, oh, you know, whatever. And my grandpa grabbed him by the shirt, spun him around bent him over his knee and spanked him. Grown man. And he said, now, do I need to tell you again? My grandpa was a deacon at a Baptist church. I just love my grandpa. I could go on and on and tell you stories. My grandpa was my hero. Strongest man I knew. I mean, just phenomenal. But a couple of stories from my grandpa. One is there was a flood back in 92, and, and a, a big sycamore tree had laid over this creek. And so my grandpa had taken two chainsaws and had got them both stuck in that tree. They pinched that tree. And so whenever that happened, uh, he came over to my house, which was just a mile down the road, said, I'm going to borrow your dad's chainsaw. You want to come with me? So I'm like, oh, yeah, it'd be awesome. So I go with my grandpa. He gets that third chainsaw stuck, this great big sycamore tree. And so he's kind of upset. He goes back and gets an axe. Now the tree's mostly cut, but he's about six foot in the air. And whenever he's up there, he has me hand him the axe. And what I do, he swings it, hits that tree. It breaks and hits him in the chest and threw, me, oh, threw him over my head. And whenever he was thrown over my head, he landed on a limb that was sticking up out of the, the gravel. It hit him right in the back. I thought it broke his back. He just go, Phew. and I thought he died. I mean, it's my hero. And I, 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 I'm like falling over. I'm like 15. I'm like, what's going on? And and finally, he rolls over and he goes, you know, wet my handkerchief. You know, this handkerchief was the grossest like piece of clothing in the world. So I like take the snot out of it and wash it. And he rubs his face. I kid you not. He looks at me and he says, don't tell your grandma. He eventually had to because of the bruises, but he broke three ribs and his leg. It had been caught in the tree, which I didn't realize as it was throwing him over. And I couldn't drive his truck because it was a five-speed and I was like 14 years old. And so he sits on the tailgate and he's like, all right, don't tell grandma. Give me just a second. He drives us out of the creek bottom. I mean, he was my hero. And here's what I could tell you about my grandpa. As strong as he was, I mean, telling you what, just love the guy. I watched him die. And, and how he died was he had, he had brain cancer. So it was in the, the top of his um, brain stem, of his spinal cord. And so his body shut down, beginning with his toes, then his legs, then eventually his organs and all the way up. So this guy that physically could do whatever he wanted was stuck in a hospital bed, and I sat next to him as he drowned. And what was so captivating to me to watch my hero essentially die of drowning was that I heard that's similar to how Jesus would have died. As he hung on that cross, his body would would convulse 
going up and down from the pain from his hands to his feet, up and down, but he would eventually lose the ability to separate the saliva from the oxygen, and his lungs would begin to fill. That was the common way. That's why whenever they stab his side, what comes out? Water. It's probably saliva. Uh, a lot. Of, he's, he's drowning. Now, I want you to know, when Jesus died on the cross, it was a very painful death, but the pain of the cross did not compare to the emotional pain. You see, other men had died before. Other men had died on the cross before. But no one in existence had ever been as abandoned, as far away from God as Jesus was in that moment. He became our sin. So when Jesus is there, he, he, this verse is true. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. He took the pain and the weight of death. Why? It was to reconcile us. Now, I'm going to give you what I call hillbilly Greek. Okay, you guys ready for this? Now, are you guys considered hillbillies? And this, I don't know what they call Illinois. Illinois. I thought that might get a reaction. Illinois uh, people. Uh, but in Southwest Missouri, we'd be hillbillies. So I don't know Greek. I'm a horrible. My friend says that I try to do a Spanish accent whenever I, I say something in Greek. So you can just laugh at me if you want. So here's what happens for me whenever I think of a Greek word like uh, minnow, for example. In John 15, it says remain. And so for me, I'm like, oh, that's like just like a minnow, right? Like you put it on a hook and you put it on the bobber and you put it in the water and the minnow's gone. It didn't remain. So that's how I remember John 15, what it means to remain. That's hillbilly Greek, just to let you know. So whenever it says reconciliation, here's going to be my hillbilly word for you. It's this. It's kalasso. Now, I don't know about that K, but at the end of it, it sounds like lasso. Now, for me, whenever I was a kid, I wanted to be, I told you, just like my grandpa, and he was a cowboy. He was a cowboy's cowboy. I mean, just an awesome guy. And so I would, in my backyard, practice roping. So I would rope whatever I could. My sister wouldn't let me. And so one day I get this bright idea. I'm going to go uh, and rope a bucket in the, in the field. And so I have a bucket there, and I'm roping it. I can rope it. And I think, well, I need to be on my horse, but I didn't have a horse, so I pretend to, to gallop, right? And I'm roping. Nobody's as entertained as, this, as I am. Well, I turn around, and I, eventually I think I'll, like, go around like this, and I'll rope it, turn around and rope it. And as I did, there was a cow that had walked up to see what was in the bucket, and I, I roped that cow. Only cow I've ever roped in my entire life. Now, the problem was the cow was much bigger than me, and this was also my dad's, like, new lair rope. And so now I'm attached to this cow. I have collapsed it, right? And so he pulled me through the manure for the next 10 minutes as I'm trying to, like, get my dad's rope back. This is what it means to be reconciled. It means to be tied to. Now, what's interesting about the word is the word for divorce is apolasso. So apolasso means to send away, to no longer be attached, but katalasso is to bring together. Here's what happens with the cross. We're being reconciled. It's now through the cross that we can be tied to God. It's through the cross that you can be uh, lassoed to him, that you could be tied up to him, that he would hold on to you through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He became sin for us so that we could become right with God, that we could enter into this relationship. This is my favorite verse in all of Scripture. John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that you would know him. The word know there is gnosko. It means to, to know intimately. Not just to have a knowledge of, but to actually have a relationship with. With. So why is the cross so important? It's because he took the curse, he became sin for us, and then through that, we're being tied to God. Now, the last thing I would tell you out of this 2 Corinthians passage is that we become new people because of the cross. Verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. So now we can find ourselves being the image of God, only through the cross. So let's kind of go through all of our points real fast, and I'll use the guitar as a, an illustration. Like, could you imagine the anger that I would have? This, this guitar was made kind of as a representation of my grandpa. It was supposed to be something special between the two of us. If you came up afterwards and were kind of jackwagging around and you broke it, you and I would have some distance, wouldn't you? Now imagine how bad it would be if you broke it on purpose, if you picked it up and tried to use it like a sledgehammer. You and I would get crossways, right? I mean, we would not be real pleased with each other. But the picture of what I've told you so far is that we were made in the image of God, but we're broken, and so we're not conducting that image well. But because of the cross, we can now be made new 
and be showing that image correctly. Isn't that good? So here's the next thing I want to tell you about the verse we just had. Uh, is that for us, here's why the, the cross is important. Because we're a special creation to be reflecting the image of God, yet we don't. But what Christ did on the cross allows us to become a new person. So what does Jesus mean whenever he says, take up the cross? If you were to look this up in Luke 9, you would see that he adds a couple words to it. In Luke 9, 23, he says that you would deny yourself and you would take up your cross daily. This is the essence of Christian living, is that daily you decide to not live with those animalistic instincts, but instead that you discipline yourself with self-control and to say, today's not about me, today is about Jesus Christ. Um, one of my favorite passages is John 3. My mom was Catholic, and so I, I always used John 3 because she said this is how she was saved. I, I, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up quickly. Does that sound good? I know everyone's tired, but if you'll stick with me for just a little bit, I'll wrap up quickly. Here's my mom's story. She was raised in a Catholic church, and so she, you know, she did confession, the Lord's Supper, all the things that she thought would save a good Catholic girl. Uh, one day she was... Uh, after school, they were giving away books, and my mom took one of the books home, and her mom said, boy, I'd like one of those books. So the next day, my mom thought, well, they were giving them away, so she just opened up the closet and took one. Well, whenever she did that, she started feeling guilty, and she thought, maybe I stole it. So she confessed it to the priest, hey, I stole one of those books. The next day at school, she got spankings for it. And so my mom said, how, how did I get spankings? I shared that in confessional. Well, that's a big bad thing in the Catholic Church. You can't share what happens in confessional. So the principal, who had just given my mom spanks, and the priest, who my mom had confessed to, got in an argument outside of the door uh, of the office. And so my mom was thinking, man, if I can't confess this to a priest, who would I confess it to? And that was whenever the Holy Spirit spoke to her, that he said, you could confess it to me. You know, if you can conceal your sin, you won't prosper, but if you confess it, you'd find mercy. So my mom begins kind of the first time to talk to the Lord instead of talking to anybody else. So she got in trouble because she started reading her Bible. And so during Catholic Mass, they would put her up in the balcony because she was, you know, that was kind of their way to punish her. So it was my mom in a Catholic church in the upper balcony that she began to read John 3, where Jesus says, unless, unless a man is born again, he would not enter the kingdom of heaven. So for my mom, this concept of being made new uh, about kind of like what Jesus said, that they would daily crucify themselves. This is what happens. My mom reads John 3, and she says, that's what I want. I want to start living for God. You see, your first birth is, is natural, and it's animalistic. You want to live for yourself. But a second birth is when you say, I have a new master and a new way of living. This is why Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, that I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. Now, let me give you a test. I, I want to give you this test and two stories, and then we'll be done, all right? Sound good? Can you stick with me that long? Test and two stories. How do you know if you are living a crucified life? Here's my test for you. What is it that you're afraid of? You see, what you're afraid of shows you that there's a part of you that's not been crucified. If you're afraid of what somebody else thinks of you, that's what needs to be crucified. Lord, remember what we talked about last night? I don't want to have any rivals. I only want to care about what you think about. If you're scared of death, then that's something that should be crucified. That I'm no longer scared of death. And have you heard the story of Lazarus? Remember Lazarus? He was called forth. Lazarus comes forth and he comes out of the grave. Do you know what historically happens to Lazarus after that? You know, Jesus is crucified. He's resurrected. The story is, historically, Lazarus goes on and kind of becomes a missionary to an island, becomes kind of a pastor on the island, and the chief of this island threatens Lazarus and says, if you don't stop preaching Christ, we're going to kill you. And you know what Lazarus's classic response to that is? You must not have heard my story. I already died. Now, could you imagine trying to intimidate Lazarus, right? I mean, somebody say, if you don't stop, we're going to kill you. And Lazarus says, man, you, you don't know, man. I already died. I came back to life. See, if you're afraid of something, what it tells me and what it should tell you is that there's something in you that was not properly crucified. Here's what Jesus says. You want to follow me? You got to take up your cross daily. That means that daily, that crucified life, there's going to be things that show up in you and that you're going to say, I I've got to change this. I, I need to, to crucify that. That part of me needs to die 
so that I could live more accurately for Christ. You see, you're saved through faith in Jesus Christ, but then you're sanctified, that is, you're made more like Christ, because daily you crucify your flesh, that animalistic nature. And you say, I want to walk in the Spirit. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, let me give you one last story, and we'll close with this story. Uh, back in April, there was the 186th anniversary of a pretty significant uh, event in America. The Texas Revolution had happened, and with it, there was kind of this uh, American-Mexican war uh, where we're kind of battling it out. And so uh, what has happened is the, uh, the Mexican government has elected a new president. His name is Santa Ana, and he's kind of more of a dictator than a president. And so he says uh, that if you're going to be uh, a Mexican, that you've got to become Catholic and you've got to begin paying some taxes and different things. So the Texans, if you know anything about Texans, they naturally revolt to everything. And so they're revolting against that. There's a hundred men in this old Catholic uh, monastery that is called the Alamo. There's a hundred people. And so St. San Anna comes in with 1,500. So it's 1,500 versus a hundred. One guy sneaks out. They get another hundred to come in as reinforcements. And for the next month and a half, these 1,500 attack the 200. It's a month and a half battle called the Alamo, and slowly the Mexican uh, militia comes in and kills each one of these people. So what happens is Santa Ana thinks that he, what he's going to do is push back the American border and take over uh, what would be now part of Texas. The problem is whenever the word begins to spread about the Alamo, they write these articles saying, remember the Alamo. These American men were killed because they're kind of trying to defend themselves. So what happens is it rallies the troops. So when Santa Anna came, he came with 1,500 men. They killed the 200. You know what happens next? April 21st, 1836, is they come, I don't know the exact number, but American men that, that volunteer, and they come in, they find Santa Anna, and they attack them. Does anybody want to know how long that battle lasts? Anybody want to take a uh, stab at it? Good, good guess. Eighteen minutes. Eighteen minutes. It took them uh, about almost two months to break into the Alamo to take over two hundred guys. The entire army is wiped out in almost eighteen minutes. And whenever they gave reports of it, they asked people what was the battle like, and they said we did not stop fighting until every man had been taken out. And they said, well, how did you know? And they said, because as long as there were enemies standing, we kept yelling, remember the Alamo. It was their battle cry. They, they went into the battle and they just yelled, remember the Alamo, until there was nobody on the opposing side that was standing anymore. Isn't that crazy? This, this famous historical battle uh, where they said, remember the Alamo, and they fought ferociously, and in 18 minutes it was over. Well, I'm here to tell you that about 2,000 years ago, the church picked up this battle cry. It wasn't the ichthus, which is a really cool symbol. And it wasn't the clover, which is a great way to kind of, uh, at least for a child, explain the Trinity, right? There are different Christian symbols that have been in the past, but you know the one that's always been our battle cry? Remember the cross. You see, it was at the cross that Jesus died for me. And it was the cross that Jesus called me to carry. And that's how I'm sanctified, is that daily there are parts of me that need to die. I was, it was 1984, I was seven years old whenever I heard about the death of Jesus Christ. It was whenever I first heard the battle cry, and it made sense to me that God was calling me not to come and sit in a church, but to join a battle. A battle that wasn't with flesh and blood, but with principalities of this world. And we had one battle cry, and it was this, the cross is enough. What Jesus Christ did was enough. For anyone that would just look to him, they could be saved. To anyone who would look to him, they could be changed. This is a great thought for us, isn't it? The cross is enough. Here's my question for you today. Number one is, is today the day that you would enlist? That Alamo battle, they, when they sent it out in the newspaper to say, remember the Alamo, there were people who would respond saying, tell me what to do. I want to be a part of the next battle. Here's what I would tell you to do. If you're, if you're not saved, you'd say, man, how do I enlist in, in God's militia, so to speak? Here's what it would be. Remember how we said, find mercy? It's a white flag. We had everybody hold up that the handkerchief last night. Here's what the white flag is for you. It's to say, Christ, I surrender. 
the way Jesus said it is, I, I deny myself. The way John says it, I need to be born again. These are all different ways to say, I want to surrender to Jesus Christ. If you've never been saved, that would be step number one. If you're here and you'd say you, you are saved, my question would be, are you living a crucified life? Have you taken up your cross daily? I'm amazed at how often in my own life, there are things that the Lord has to continually remind me to crucify. I'd say if you're a child of God, you might already have something that you're saying, you know what, I, I've got to begin to get over this. There's this thing I'm afraid of, this sin that has entangled me, that I've got to crucify again. That would be the point of our